Seven years after a woman vanishes, a trail of evidence leads investigators to an isolated boat ramp on the Missouri River. They must pull proof of her murder from the murky river. In a rural Virginia county, a skull and a piece of jewelry are the only clues police have to identify a victim. But will it be enough to catch a killer? A woman is missing for weeks. When her body is discovered, the police must piece together their case from a few torn shreds of tape. When someone disappears, it's difficult for police to prove murder without a body. But today, forensic science can find justice for a victim months and sometimes even years after they have gone missing. Maryville, Missouri is a small Midwestern town. But in 1990, it was caught in the grip of a big city problem. To combat a growing methamphetamine industry, investigators sought help from those on the inside. Christine Elkins had been arrested for selling the drug. In exchange for immunity, Christine cooperated with authorities by helping to build a case against her supplier. She agreed to tape their next meeting with a micro cassette recorder concealed in her clothing. On July 26, 1990, under the watchful eyes of investigators, Elkins met with the distributor at his house. You got the stuff? From the moment she walked in, Tony stuff? Emery, her dealer, was suspicious. He grabbed Christine and searched her. He threatened to kill her if she ever betrayed him. Agent Mike Schmitz headed up the case for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. She came back afterwards extremely upset, stating that he knew that I was wired. He attempted to locate the recorder. She was uh, extremely upset. Christine told agents that she was afraid for her safety. They urged her to stay away from Tony. When agents tried to listen to the tape, it was indecipherable. The case against Tony Emery would have to be made on informant testimony. A few weeks before Christine was scheduled to testify against him, police received a call from her mother. She hadn't heard from her daughter in several days, and she was worried. A search of Christine's house indicated no sign of a struggle. Her car, a maroon Oldsmobile, was gone. Missouri State Police worked with the ATF on the Emory narcotics case. Investigator Larry Bodenhammer. Well, the investigation changed on after her disappearance because uh, after after a period of time, uh, it was like, well, where is she? You know, what has happened to her? Uh, has she left on her own accord, or has has something happened to her? Investigators interviewed Christine's friends and acquaintances. One friend told police she'd seen her around 10 o'clock the night she disappeared. Christine had asked her to watch her son for a few minutes while she met someone. Christine made a chilling prediction as she left. If she wasn't back in a few minutes, she'd be in the morgue. No one had seen her since. All right, I need to bring everybody up to date. The ATF and the police now suspected that Tony Emery was behind her disappearance. He had a strong motive, but without evidence of an actual crime, authorities could not prove his involvement. 
Three weeks later, Maryville police received a tip from a federal drug enforcement agent in Colorado. Starting strong. A methamphetamine manufacturer uh, facing yeah. time in federal prison wanted to make a deal. He claimed he knew about the murder of a female informant in Maryville. Investigators feared he was referring to Christine Elkins. Maryville police and ATF agents flew to Colorado to question James Witt. He told them he manufactured methamphetamine for Tony Emery and his cousin Herb Emery. He said he'd heard the two men talking about killing an informant in Missouri. In exchange for leniency, Witt agreed to meet Herb Emery and wear a wire. Authorities hoped their conversation would provide details of the alleged murder and possibly lead them to Christine Elkins. Three months after Christine's disappearance, Witt met Herb Emery in a restaurant parking lot. Agents listened to their conversation from a car nearby. Witt pretended he needed to get rid of a body and asked for advice. Herb Emery told him the best way to dispose of a body was to put it in the trunk of a car and sink it in a rock quarry. It was investigators' first clue. Using detailed maps, they identified rock quarries deep enough to conceal a car. But the Midwest, famous for its native limestone, had literally hundreds of quarries. To narrow their search further, they had to think like a killer. If you've got a, a, a person in the trunk of the car, what would you do? Would you drive a long ways when it wasn't your car? You could break down. If you were to find a rock quarry, it would have to be something close. It would have to be something that you didn't have to drive. It was a very wet season. You wouldn't have to drive through a field because you might get stuck. They focused on a 75-mile radius, but that still left hundreds of possibilities. Over the next several months, investigators systematically searched those rock quarries for a car containing a body. They found nothing. The ATF, the Missouri State Police, and Maryville Police considered the Emerys dangerous, but lacked sufficient evidence to support a murder charge. Setting up a task force, investigators devised a strategy to get them off the street until they could prove murder. Federal agents again used James Witt, this time to set up a methamphetamine buy. Herb and Tony Emery met Witt at a prearranged location. Agents observed as Tony Emery gave Witt $20,000 for several pounds of the drug. They moved in to make the arrest. In the summer of 1991, Herb and Tony Emery were convicted of conspiracy to keep and sell methamphetamine. They were sentenced to nine years in a federal penitentiary. With the Emerys in prison, authorities were able to focus on the disappearance and possible homicide of Christine Elkins. According to Maryville police investigator Randy Strong, Tony Emery was a dangerous man to cross. The community had a, a great fear of Tony Emery. Uh, if we had a witness to him doing a crime, they simply wouldn't come forward or uh, they would back out of the case. Uh, no one wanted to talk about it uh, because they were afraid of what he might do to them. But with the Emery cousins safely behind bars, Authorities hoped their associates would no longer be afraid to talk. And they had a lead. In their taped conversations, Herb Emery had told James Witt about a third man who was present the night of the murder. Bobby Miller was a friend of Herb's in Colorado. But when investigators tried to question Miller, they got nowhere. Even from prison, the Emery's cast a frightening shadow. 
Investigators went to one of the Emery's rental properties mentioned in a monitored conversation between Herb Emery and James Witt. They suspected that this was the site where Christine had been murdered. The woman who answered the door confirmed that she rented the house from the Emery's. Once inside, investigators were dismayed to find the house had been gutted and remodeled. If Christine had been murdered on the premises, all evidence of the crime had been destroyed. Out of options, the investigators re-examined their case files, looking for a clue, something they might have missed the first time, that would link the Emery's to Christine's murder. The investigators found phone records linking Bobby Miller to Herb Emery around the time Christine disappeared. They also learned that Bobby Miller had rented a truck near Maryville the night Christine was last seen. It suggested his involvement, but they had to find a way to get him to talk. In September 1996, six years after Christine's disappearance, police went back to Miller. Okay, Bobby, you know why They offered him immunity in exchange for his testimony. And your attorney has given us On the advice of his attorney, Miller took the deal. You really pin all this down? Miller admitted he was outside Herb Emery's rental property the night Christine Elkins disappeared. He said he watched her go inside where Herb and Tony waited. When he heard screams, he panicked and drove off. Investigators believed they knew what happened next. But without a body, making a murder case against the Emery's would be difficult, if not impossible. Seven years had passed since Christine Elkin's disappearance. The ATF and the Maryville, Missouri police had Bobby Miller's account of her murder, but no evidence to back it up. And they were running out of time. The suspects in her disappearance, Tony and Herb Emery, were about to be paroled from prison. Determined to prevent their release, authorities scrutinized every facet of their case they decided to take a closer look at the Emery's associates. Dana Kleiser wasn't directly involved with Emery or his drug ring. In fact, investigators interviewed him only because Tony had once dated his sister. According to Kleiser, Tony Emery arrived at his rural home the night Christine disappeared. He asked to borrow some gas then asked Kleiser to show him a nearby boat ramp. Wary of Emery's reputation, Kleiser didn't ask any questions, but led him to a boat ramp on the Missouri River. Tony told him to wait several miles away. Pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. Investigators now believed they knew the location of the car containing Christine's body. We now realized that we had to try, at least plan, to recover a body out of the Missouri River. And I think the thing that was going through both of our minds was a great flood of 1993. And I know I was thinking that, unfortunately, Christine is probably in the uh, Gulf someplace now after that flood. The currents of the Missouri River are normally powerful enough to move something the size of a car great distances. During the 1993 floods, the river became a raging torrent that overflowed its banks and caused millions of dollars in damage. It was yet another long shot, but it was all investigators had to go on. To make a case against the Emery's, they had to find Christine's car. They enlisted the help of a nonprofit organization called NecroSearch International. These Colorado-based scientists helped law enforcement around the world find clandestine graves and hidden evidence. So, but this is where you think, you think somewhere down 
when Clark Davenport, a forensic geophysicist with NecroSearch, arrived at the boat ramp, he'd already amassed a wealth of data. Prior to coming out to take magnetic measurements, we looked at uh, the make and model of the car, we talked to the manufacturer to determine the mass of metal in the motor. Uh, we also looked at the currents in the river, the river bottom conditions, river speed, the floods that happened since the car had gone into the river, and the float time from the manufacturer, how long they figured a car would float. Armed with that information, NecroSearch scientists spent two days searching a six-mile area adjacent to the boat ramp. They used a magnetometer, a torpedo-shaped device that measures changes in magnetic fields. Floating several feet below the river's surface, it takes readings every two seconds and recognizes large masses such as a car. Used in conjunction with global positioning satellites, the magnetometer enabled NecroSearch scientists to precisely pinpoint five locations where abnormal masses, or anomalies, were present on the riverbed. I felt pretty confident that the anomalies were consistent with what I would expect from a car of that size. The next day, investigators returned to the boat ramp with a team of divers. Fighting the murky river's current, the divers searched the five areas Davenport pinpointed as likely locations for the car. Within hours, one of the divers surfaced holding up a Missouri license plate. Against all odds, investigators had finally found Christine Elkin's car. This was an incredible moment. Uh, it was kind of like Excalibur coming up out of the lake with the sword. You know, it's just amazing. It, you know, just the emotion that was involved in that. Uh, we knew that we were getting closer now. We we're going to put closure on this case. Divers attached steel cables to the car and pulled it from the water. It was sent to a Maryville garage for processing. Inside, Forensic examiners discovered a piece of wood wedged between the driver's seat and the accelerator. In the trunk, they found bones wrapped in carpet padding. Using hospital x-rays, the medical examiner confirmed that they had finally found the remains of Christine Elkins. The autopsy revealed a large hole in the skull, consistent with blunt force trauma. Christine had apparently been beaten to death. Investigators had the physical evidence they needed to charge the Emery's with murder. They believed Tony found out Christine was going to testify against him and offered her money to disappear. She was too terrified to turn him down. But when she went to the house that night, the Emery's had other plans. Once inside, Tony and Herb attacked Christine. Tony dealt the lethal blow, striking her in the head with a heavy flashlight. Her body was wrapped in carpet padding, put in the trunk of her car, and driven to the boat ramp. There, Tony rigged the accelerator and sent the car down the ramp into the river. Herb Emery pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Tony Emery was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In Maryville, authorities knew the name of the victim and suspected killers, but struggled for seven years to find her body. In a rural Virginia county, Investigators had to identify a body before the search for a murderer could even begin. Amelia County is a sprawling community located in the rolling hills of western Virginia. It's a neighborly area with a low crime rate. Not the place for murder. In 
In 1990, while hunting for deer, a man made a gruesome discovery. On an embankment near a small creek, he found a human skull. He took it to the Amelia County Sheriff's Department. Sheriff Jimmy Weaver examined the skull. Its condition told him it had been outside for some time. The presence of a long reddish hair, as well as the skull's small size and features, suggested that the victim was probably female. Two opposing holes in the skull were consistent with entry and exit wounds made by a single bullet. Sheriff Weaver and his deputy went out to the scene. On my way in, I was trying to think of uh, who it could be. There was no one in Amelia missing, no one had called me. Amelia is a small, close county. Um, if something happens, we know right away. After securing the area, Weaver conducted a thorough search. They found more bones, jewelry, part of a blanket, and a piece of denim. Concerned that animals might have scattered additional clues, the investigators broadened their search. They soon discovered what appeared to be an arm bone and a gold bracelet. The evidence seemed to confirm Sheriff Weaver's original theory that the victim was female. Weaver sent the evidence to the Virginia State Medical Examiner's Office in Richmond for analysis. Chief Medical Examiner Marcella Fierro examined the remains. The skull told her a great deal about the victim. First, it showed that it was a young white female. Second, it showed that it had a gunshot wound and that there was injury related to this gunshot wound and that the, the trajectory of where this bullet went in and where it fractured on the other side indicated it had a path that was lethal. As the examination of the skeletal remains continued, the medical examiner's office was able to establish that the victim had been five feet two to five feet four inches tall with reddish blonde hair. The description was distributed to law enforcement agencies across the state of Virginia. The search was on for any missing women matching Amelia County's Jane Doe. Now, Sheriff Weaver could only hope and wait. In January 1990, the Sheriff's Department in Amelia County, Virginia, needed a lead to establish the identity of skeletal remains found in an isolated area. It wasn't long in coming. Police in Chesapeake, Virginia, reported that a woman who fit the victim's description had been missing for eight months. Dental records confirmed the victim was 29-year-old Regina Butkowski, known to her friends as Jeannie. The same day, deputies showed Jeannie's mother the jewelry recovered from the scene. She identified it as her daughter's. Chesapeake police forwarded the Butkowski case files to Amelia County. As Weaver reviewed them, he learned the circumstances of Jeannie's disappearance. On the evening of May 6, 1989, Jeannie's roommate discovered that the front door of their house had been kicked in. Concerned, she checked the parking lot for Jeannie's car. It wasn't there. She called Jeannie's mother, who said she'd last spoken to her daughter at 10.45 the night before. One fact in the police files immediately caught Sheriff Weaver's attention. Jeannie's stormy relationship with a man named Purnell Jefferson. Jeannie had met Jefferson at a local gym. He became her personal trainer, and the two dated for several months. When Jefferson became too possessive, Jeannie tried to distance herself from him, but he refused to back off. One of the things that he had somewhat of an 
obsession with was with Regina. He was not going to accept the fact that, that she wasn't his. Jefferson's obsession had become frighteningly clear when he allegedly kidnapped Jeannie in March 1989. But by an amazing stroke of luck, more than seven minutes of that struggle had been recorded on her home answering machine. It was a very dramatic tape. No one really knew how it was recorded, but it was. And it was a situation where you would hear her tell no Purnell, don't hurt me, don't do things. And it proceeded on, you could hear noise in the background. And probably one of the most dramatic things of it is that at one time you heard this tremendously deep sob from Regina. Weaver learned that Jeannie's roommate told Jefferson about the tape and threatened to call police. He released Jeannie. She refused to press charges against him, however, out of fear he might take out his anger on someone close to her. Two months later, Jeannie Butkowski again disappeared. Sheriff Weaver focused the investigation on Purnell Jefferson. A lead came in from Jeannie's parents. They had received a letter regarding their daughter's car from an apartment complex in Richmond, Virginia, 130 miles away from Jeannie's home. The manager of the apartments alerted them that Jeannie's car had been sitting in the parking lot for six months. Investigators examined her car, hoping for clues to link Jefferson to the murder. They were disappointed. During the time the car had been there, it had been subjected to the elements. When they had the flood in Richmond, it had been submerged in the flood. So a lot of the evidentiary value from that vehicle was lost. But a new lead was quickly established. A resident of the apartment complex told investigators that he knew a man who used to drive the car. Investigators soon learned that Jeannie's car had changed hands several times. They eventually traced it to a man named Daryl Jones, who was incarcerated in Henrico County. Jones told deputies he bought the car from a local man named Wes Green. Green was with a stranger who claimed the car belonged to his girlfriend. He'd taken it away from her and driven it up from Chesapeake because he was angry with her. Investigators suspected the stranger was Purnell Jefferson. They wanted to know more and believed Wes Green might hold the key. They just needed to find him. As evidence against Purnell Jefferson mounted, the Amelia County Sheriff's Department believed his friend, Wes Green, might know more about the murder of Jeannie Butkowski. Deputies quickly tracked Green down to an apartment complex in Richmond. When questioned, he admitted he helped Jefferson get rid of Jeannie's car. The officer persisted. Green added that Jefferson had borrowed a co-worker's car around the time Jeannie disappeared. If the car had been used to dispose of her body, it was probable that incriminating evidence had been left behind. Deputies went to the appliance rental store where Purnell Jefferson had once worked. A co-worker confirmed that on May 5th, the day Jeannie disappeared, Jefferson had borrowed his car. He didn't return the vehicle until late that night. A few days later, Jefferson went to lunch and never returned. Investigators obtained permission to search the employee's car. The search yielded incriminating results. Technicians found traces of lime, a corrosive substance that hastens decomposition. More importantly, they found a reddish blonde hair similar to the one found on Jeannie Butkowski's skull. The hair was sent to the crime lab for analysis. A comparison indicated the two hairs were consistent in texture and color. Investigators now had their first physical evidence connecting Jefferson to Jeannie Butkowski's murder. 
Sheriff Weaver swore out a warrant for the arrest of Purnell Jefferson on capital murder charges. Authorities traced Jefferson to Stewart, Florida, where he'd moved shortly after Jeannie's disappearance. On February 3rd, 1990, a SWAT team burst into the suspect's home to find him hiding in a closet. They quickly took him into custody. Five months later, Jefferson was extradited to Amelia County to stand trial for murder. Based on the evidence, investigators pieced together the events of the night Jeannie Butkowski died. On May 5th, 1989, Purnell Jefferson and Wes Green drove from Richmond to Chesapeake and broke into Jeannie's house as she slept. Jeannie struggled with Jefferson, who dragged her outside. He forced her into her own car and sped away. Green left separately. Although investigators never learned the precise location of her murder, they suspected Jefferson stopped at a remote area as he drove back to Richmond. He initially disposed of her body just outside the city. Fearing it might be discovered there, Jefferson recruited Wes Green to help him move the body to Amelia County, where they buried it in a shallow grave. Purnell Jefferson thought he'd covered his tracks, but he underestimated Sheriff Weaver and his deputies. He thought that he would bring her out to a rural county to where that probably there was a rural law enforcement agency that, uh, that wouldn't find it, or if they did, wouldn't solve it. On March 28, 1991, Burnell Jefferson stood trial in Amelia County for killing Jeannie Butkowski. He was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years. Wes Green was also charged and convicted for his role in Jeannie's abduction. In a murder investigation, police often discover the killer was close to the victim. But when a killer preys on a stranger, he is far more difficult to find. Nestled at the junction of two rivers, Wichita, Kansas is an all-American city with a touch of Old West charm. In this story, some of the names have been changed. On September 17, 1995, a woman phoned the Wichita police to report a missing person. She said her friend, Jody McCown, got into a maroon car on South Broadway around 1.30 the night before and hadn't returned. Most missing persons turn up within a few days, but South Broadway is a tough neighborhood plagued by drugs and prostitution. The Wichita police immediately began looking for Jody McCown. Detectives contacted Becky Sims, the woman who called in the missing persons report, hoping she could give them more information. Becky told them she was with Jody and her boyfriend, Keith Perry, the night Jody disappeared. A man drove up in a maroon car and told them he was looking for drugs. He introduced himself as Chester Higginbotham. Jody and Keith got into the car to talk to him. Becky heard the man offer Jody $200 to help him find drugs. Jody was reluctant, but Keith said they needed the money. He took $100 and got out of the car. Detective Dana Gouge recalls Becky was uneasy about the unusual circumstances of Higginbotham's request. She was very suspicious of the situation because of um, the amount of money that was offered to Jody um, in this situation. She found it very strange. Uh, so strange that she wrote down the tag number of the car. 
Investigators traced the license plate to a resident named Matthew Murphy, who lived in the nearby town of Newton. They wondered who Chester Higginbotham was and how he was connected to Murphy. They ran a background check on the two men. I'm working on that now. They also ran a background check on Jody's boyfriend, Keith Perry. They soon learned he had several outstanding drug warrants. During questioning, Perry confirmed Becky Sims's account of Jody's disappearance, with one major difference. He denied encouraging her to join Higginbotham in the car. Suspicious of Perry's involvement, detectives obtained a warrant to search his apartment. They didn't find anything to implicate him, but collected various items for possible DNA testing later. By now, investigators had the results from the background checks on Chester Higginbotham and Matthew Murphy. A comparison of fingerprints, photographs, and DMV records proved that Matthew Murphy and Chester Higginbotham were the same man. He had arrest records for burglary and theft going back many years under both names. In fact, there were several burglary charges pending against the Murphy alias in Kansas, as well as other states. The identity change and arrest records made Lieutenant Ken Landwehr of the Wichita Police Department highly suspicious. When we find out that Matthew Murphy is an alias for Chester Higginbotham, uh, it's again a, a clue that's going to show us that he's trying to hide his background, which has to mean that if he's hiding his background, there's probably something there uh, that's more serious than burglaries and thefts. Police called Higginbotham, who readily admitted he picked up Jody McCown on September 16th. But he said he dropped her off later and hadn't seen her since. Despite his claim, police were anxious to question him and search his residence. We had hopes of being able to look through his house, uh, try to determine whether or not he may have been involved in this, and also we had hopes that we would be able to find Jody alive. Because Higginbotham was the last person seen with Jody, investigators were able to obtain a search warrant. Whatever he was hiding, Investigators hope to find the answers in his house. Wichita and Newton, Kansas police struggled to solve the disappearance of 28-year-old Jody McCown. She was last seen with a man named Chester Higginbotham. When investigators arrived at Higginbotham's house, nobody was there. Armed with a warrant, they began searching for clues. Detective T. Walton found nothing to suggest murder. We were picking up fibers from carpeting. We were looking at uh, his boots and his shoes. Uh, we were looking for a body, but we did not find a body inside the house. Investigators were pondering their next move when a car pulled up in front of the house and a couple got out. The man calmly identified himself as Matthew Murphy and asked what was happening. Investigators produced a warrant and brought them to the station for questioning. Have a seat in that chair. Under interrogation, Murphy admitted his real name was Chester Higginbotham. He claimed he assumed an alias when he and his wife were placed into the Federal Witness Protection Program. According to Higginbotham, they were both witnesses in a mob-related murder case. Higginbotham reiterated his original account, that he picked up a girl fitting Jody McCown's description on September 16th. He said she was leaving town, so he dropped her off at the bus station around midnight. To detectives, his story didn't quite ring true. His times of dropping Jody off were not consistent with the times that our bus stations were open here in Wichita, either the city buses or the trailway buses. By going in and questioning him about that, he was still insistent that that's what he did. We knew that that could not have been true. 
At the investigator's request, Higginbotham agreed to submit blood, hair, and saliva samples in the event a DNA comparison was called for in the future. Detectives also spoke with his wife, Vicky. She told them she didn't know her husband's real name was Higginbotham and contradicted his assertion that they were in the witness protection program. Vicky also said her marriage was troubled and she believed her husband was seeing other women. When asked about the night Jody McCown disappeared, Vicky said she came home from work and found a note from her husband. He said he was going to pick up parts for a car he was working on at a rented garage. When he hadn't arrived home by 3 a.m., Vicky drove to the garage to look for him. She said she caught him with a girl in his car. Although her husband wouldn't let her near the vehicle, she could see a girl with brown hair in the passenger seat. When Vicky confronted her husband, he claimed he was only giving the girl a ride. Vicky told him to come home immediately and then left. She said her husband arrived at the house about five minutes later. Based on the contradictory information obtained from Vicky, investigators questioned Higginbotham again. When they asked him about the girl at the garage, he claimed she was a friend from a local bar. But detectives suspected it was Jody McCown. Armed with a warrant, police searched Higginbotham's rented garage. Inside the suspect's car, they found a wad of green duct tape with hair stuck in the adhesive. Investigators also collected a white button with thread, black zip ties, a roll of green duct tape, and yellow rope. Detectives now believe Chester Higginbotham had murdered Jody McCown, but they still couldn't prove it without a body. Over the course of several weeks, Investigators conducted a thorough search of the area surrounding his rented garage, but they didn't find anything. Without Jody McCown's body, it appeared Chester Higginbotham might be getting away with murder. Weeks after her disappearance, Wichita police were no closer to finding Jody McCown. Though they suspected a man named Chester Higginbotham was involved in her disappearance, they had no solid proof that a crime had even been committed. On October 11th, nearly a month after Jody's disappearance, a county groundskeeper working on the outskirts of town made a grisly discovery. The decomposed body of a woman lay in a ditch by the side of the road. When investigators arrived, they believed they'd finally found Jody McCown. The victim lay face down. A sweater and various undergarments were found near the body. As they searched for clues, the scene yielded a wealth of physical evidence. She had the black plastic zip ties on her. She had green duct tape, just like what was found in the shed, wrapped completely around her head, covering her nose and mouth area. Um, the hands and, and feet were bound together with yellow rope that was similar to the rope that was all in the shed. Fingerprint analysis confirmed the victim was Jody McCown. The medical examiner performed an autopsy and collected hair and fiber evidence from the body. She removed the duct tape for further analysis. Based on her findings, the medical examiner ruled the probable cause of death was asphyxiation caused by the duct tape covering the victim's nose and mouth. 
Due to the advanced decomposition of the body, the medical examiner was unable to determine whether Jody had been sexually assaulted. And there was insufficient material for DNA analysis. Detectives would have to build their case on other evidence. At the Wichita Police Department Crime Lab, evidence technician Patrick Cunningham hoped the duct tape would lead investigators to her killer. Using a solution called gentian violet, Cunningham looked for latent prints left on the tape. When the dye comes into contact with human protein residues, like those left by fingerprints, a vivid purple stain appears. When the tape from Jody McCown's body was put into the gentian violet solution, the results were disappointing. And when we examined the back side of it, near the torn edge, there were some partial fingerprint impressions in that area, but there wasn't enough minutia for comparative purposes. Forensic examiners had one last chance to make their case against Chester Higginbotham. At the Sedgwick County Regional Forensic Science Center in Wichita, forensic examiner Gary Miller would use fracture analysis to try to prove the duct tape from Jody's body came from the roll of tape in Higginbotham's rented garage. First, he painstakingly separated individual pieces from the tape recovered from Jody's body. Then, he analyzed the torn edges to establish the sequence in which the pieces had been torn from the roll. Upon aligning the torn edge, we can go and see that the fractures, such as a jigsaw puzzle, fits together, but we're also able to align that the spacing between these threads are consistent. And visually, we can tell from the color they are consistent. Miller's analysis proved that the roll of duct tape collected from Higginbotham's garage had been used to bind Jody McCown. Forensic scientists also compared fibers recovered from the victim's clothing with carpet fibers taken from Higginbotham's car. Under a microscope, the texture and color of the fibers were consistent. Detectives had finally established physical links between Jody McCown and Chester Higginbotham. Scientists then compared the button and thread found at the garage with those on Jody McCown's shirt. They carefully measured the buttons, noting similarities in size, design, and material. The threads from the garage and the victim's shirt were consistent. In the end, Forensic science had given detectives enough evidence to make a homicide charge stick. Based on the evidence, police reconstructed the sequence of events on the night Jody was murdered. They believe Chester Higginbotham took Jody McCown to the rental garage. He overpowered her, bound her with duct tape, and killed her. He then disposed of the body in a ditch by the side of the road. Chester Higginbotham, also known as Matthew Murphy, was convicted of first-degree murder and kidnapping. He was sentenced to 40 years without the possibility of parole. Once, time and the elements could destroy evidence linking a killer to his victim. But forensic technology has found new ways around these obstacles. Investigators can overcome impossible odds and bring justice to murder victims who were long considered missing. Unidentified body turns up in the woods of North Carolina. With no motive and no suspects, investigators struggle to find the killer. In California, a housewife is taken into custody. 
When no record of her arrest turns up, detectives begin to fear the worst. A tragic horse accident ends the life of a Montana woman. But examiners uncover the markings of murder. When a crime scene yields vague clues, detectives must piece together their case through other means. Forensic science has found ways to uncover motive, exposing those who kill for love or money. North Carolina's northwest corner is dominated by rugged terrain, its landscape untouched by the problems of city life. That was about to change. On January 7, 1994, a Department of Transportation worker surveyed some land near a rural highway. He made a horrifying discovery. Investigators from the Watauga County Sheriff's Department were called to the scene. Hidden among the overgrowth, they found a body. Though the cool weather helped preserve the body, investigators determined he had been there for some time. The victim, a male in his 30s or 40s, had gunshot wounds on the left temple and the right side of the neck. The body was completely nude except for a watch and ring on his left hand. But other than the jewelry, there wasn't much evidence to identify the victim or tie him to his killer. Investigators scoured the scene around the body, searching for any scrap of evidence. A few feet from the body, they found a piece of black electrical tape. The single strand of tape was collected and sent to the crime lab for analysis. Captain Paula Townsend worked the case. Hoping to identify the John Doe, she entered what little information she had into the police database. We knew that we did not have any outstanding missing persons in our county, so we would have to make some effort to locate uh, uh, a missing person from another area and determine his identity. They didn't have to wait long. Later that evening, Detectives got a call from police in nearby Salisbury. A man in their town had been reported missing several weeks before. He fit the description of the dead body found along the road. His name was Victor Gunnarsson. Salisbury police agreed to forward their case file. An autopsy showed that two bullets to the head had ended the victim's life. Analysis of the stomach showed the presence of undigested potatoes eaten within five hours of his murder. Thank you. Townsend searched through Gunnarsson's case file looking for any clue that could help her identify him as the victim. There was nothing conclusive. But if Gunnarsson was the victim, Townsend learned he had a sensational past. Victor Gunnarsson was actually a Swedish national um, he had come to the United States seeking political asylum because he had actually been uh, criminally charged with assassinating the Prime Minister Olaf Palme in Sweden a few years earlier. Gunnarsson had been held as the primary suspect in the assassination, but was released when no witnesses could identify him as the killer. Watauga investigators were having a similar problem. To confirm that the body was his, Investigators requested his fingerprints, which were on file at Interpol. A week after the body was found, the prints arrived in North Carolina. They matched. Now, police had to determine why someone wanted Victor Gunnarsson dead. 
his notorious past could not be ignored. When we uh, learned about what had happened to him in Sweden, we didn't know if it was related or not. Um, we did have to consider that possibility that uh, there was some political motivation in his death. The small town murder had huge international implications. But as investigators probed Gunnarsson's final days, they learned he had other problems close to home. In January, having heard about the case on the news, a woman named Kay Whedon came forward to make a statement. She'd met Gunnarsson on Thanksgiving and had been out with him several times that week. About two months ago. But after their last date on December 3rd, she hadn't heard from him again. That night, he'd taken her out to dinner. Whedon confirmed that Gunnarsson had eaten a baked potato at that time. Based on the autopsy results, investigators knew that this was his last meal. After dinner, Whedon invited him back to her place. But they were not alone. Whedon's ex-boyfriend, L.C. Underwood, and a friend named Shelley Thompson cruised by the house around 11 p.m. It wasn't a friendly visit. Kay Whedon described her stormy two-year relationship with Underwood to police. Though they'd broken up, he refused to let her out of his life. Um, he had stalked her for some time. He was very jealous and obsessive. Um, there were several incidents where um, he had confronted her um, when she was with another date. And the fact that he drove by on the night of December 3rd when Victor Gunnarsson was in her house um, caused him to um, be a suspect in this case. The theory that Gunnarsson was the target of a political assassination was losing its credibility. L.C. Underwood's obsessive jealousy made him a prime suspect in the Swede's murder. But it wouldn't be an easy case to pursue. In addition to being a suspect, he was also a cop. L.C. Underwood had been in law enforcement for 19 and a half years. He began his law enforcement career in uh, Wilkesboro, North Carolina. And he later moved through a couple of other agencies before he finally moved to Salisbury. And he had been a police officer in Salisbury for um, about eight years. Pointing the finger at a police officer is tricky business. If investigators' suspicions about Underwood were wrong, they'd be destroying a colleague's professional and personal life. But if they were correct, they'd be fighting an uphill battle against someone who knew how to hide evidence. To make their case, investigators would have to stay one step ahead of Underwood. Instead of confronting him directly, detectives began by questioning the people around him. Shelley Thompson had been in the car when the suspect drove by Whedon's house. Underwood had told her that he was doing a favor for a friend when he drove by and jotted down Gunnarsson's license plate number. Thompson said that when they returned to his house, he called the station and asked a colleague to run the plates. Had you had any contact? Investigators confirmed that Underwood was given Gunnarsson's name and address that night. The information was enough for police to obtain a warrant to search Underwood's home. They were about to confront a fellow police officer with a prime suspect in their murder investigation. As they searched his house, investigators asked Underwood what he knew about Victor Gunnarsson's murder. Not only did Underwood deny any knowledge of the crime, he claimed he'd never even heard the name before. The suspect had just been caught in a lie. But that didn't prove murder. Investigators needed solid physical evidence to connect him to the crime. The initial search of the Immaculate Home contributed nothing to the case. If Underwood had killed the Swede, he was too smart and too organized to leave a smoking gun. The only way to catch him would be to find less obvious clues in unexpected places. 
Behind the washing machine, they noticed something they had seen before. A piece of black electrical tape, like the one found near Victor Gunnarsson's body. It appeared the meticulous cop had underestimated his colleague's determination. Watauga County, North Carolina police struggled to solve the murder of 38-year-old Victor Gunnarsson. In the home of the prime suspect, police officer L.C. Underwood, here, come on back over here. investigators found a critical piece of evidence, black electrical tape. One particular piece of tape that was found on the back of um, Underwood's dryer in his utility room was consistent in um, several ways with the tape that was found at the crime scene near Victor Gunnarsson's body. The unlikely clue was turned over to the Trace Evidence Department at the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. Technicians compared the sample with the tape found at the crime scene. Trace evidence expert Troy Hamlin studied and compared the characteristics of the two samples. The physical dimensions were compared, the width, the thickness, the composition was also compared, which were inorganic and organic characteristics. All of these were consistent with one another, and therefore those two items of evidence could have originated from the same roll of tape. It was a key finding, but the case against Underwood couldn't be made on the tape evidence alone. Detectives needed something to physically link the suspect directly to the victim. They obtained a warrant to search his car. But like his house, the vehicle was impeccably clean. Even the trunk was spotless. Still, investigators refused to simply walk away. The trunk liner was removed and sent to the lab for closer analysis. That too would be a struggle. The liner had been recently washed and vacuumed, removing a great deal of trace evidence in the process. Using sticky tape, Examiner Troy Hamlin went over every square inch of the liner, searching for any microscopic clue that survived the cleaning. He found nothing. The veteran police officer, it seemed, was getting away with murder. But then, Hamlin spotted a minuscule clue that could potentially have enormous value he plucked a single hair root, barely visible to the naked eye. Probing more carefully at that area of the carpet, he was able to extract 17 more hairs, deeply embedded in the weave. Hairs collected from the victim and those found in the carpeting were mounted on slides and analyzed under a comparison microscope. The microscopic analysis showed that the hairs were physically indistinguishable. Detectives finally had the break they needed. When I received a phone call from the lab analyst who told me that he had found the head hair in uh, Underwood's trunk mat that was consistent with Victor Gunnarsson's, I was ecstatic. But if their entire physical case was going to hang by this microscopic evidence, Investigators needed irrefutable proof. Examiners determined that the hair contained enough material for a DNA analysis. The tests confirmed that the DNA sequence from the hair found in the trunk of the suspect's vehicle was the same as the DNA sequence taken from the victim's blood. With Underwood now physically linked to the murder victim, police Move finally had the evidence they needed. A warrant was obtained for his arrest. Underwood's game of cat and mouse had come to an end. Police theorized that on December 3rd, having seen his ex-girlfriend with another man, Underwood became enraged with jealousy. He paid a late night visit to Gunnarsson's apartment and abducted his rival.
with his victim tied up inside the trunk, Underwood drove for over an hour before arriving at Gunnarsson's final destination. He fired two shots into Gunnarsson's head, then began the process of covering up his crime. In July of 1997, L.C. Underwood was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Fueled by jealous rage, L.C. Underwood would stop at nothing to keep Kay Wheaton in his life. Others will use manipulation and murder as a means to satisfy their desires. An hour north of Los Angeles, the Pacific Coast Highway winds its way through Ventura, a city of beautiful beaches, a thriving harbor, and a close-knit community. On May 6, 1996, Michael Daly contacted the Ventura Police Department to report his wife Sherry missing. He told police that his wife had driven their boys to school early that morning. When it came time to pick the children up three hours later, she didn't show. The 35-year-old woman was known as a loving and responsible mother. It wasn't like her to forget her children. He said that his wife had planned to do some shopping earlier in the day. No one had heard from her since. Detective Sean Conroy of the Ventura Police Department worked the case. He knew from experience that Sherry may have gone missing on purpose. Well, the reaction to any missing person's case is uh, generally, uh, if a full-grown adult is missing, it's because they want to be missing. But concerned family members didn't believe that Sherry would leave her children. They drove around town until they spotted Sherry's van in the parking lot of a discount store. They contacted police. Inside the vehicle, investigators found her keys, purse, and a Mother's Day gift she'd purchased at the store. There were no other clues, nor any indication of a struggle. The following day, detectives convened for their regular weekly meeting. One of the officers mentioned that a Ventura resident had called in about having seen a strange arrest the day before. It was in the same parking lot where Sherry Daly's van was found. They paid a visit to the witness. He said he saw a woman fitting Sherry's description, being handcuffed by a blonde woman in a tan suit. The blonde appeared to be a law enforcement officer. He then saw the woman in handcuffs being placed into a green car and driven away. The witness tried to catch the license plate, but it appeared to have been masked over. Investigators were now hopeful that Sherry was not missing at all. At that time, we felt that another uh, police agency had come in our jurisdiction and made an arrest without notifying us. And we felt that by making a few phone calls uh, that we would discover uh, that the person in the missing persons report, Sherry Daly, had been arrested and uh, we had solved the case and, uh, with just a few hours work. But any hope for a speedy resolution was Last soon crushed. Was in, uh, no law enforcement officer from Ventura or any other jurisdiction had any record of such an incident. Police now believe they had a kidnapping on their hands. And with no communication from the kidnapper, they feared they might also be looking at a homicide. Detectives wanted to interview Michael Daly in greater detail, but when they went to talk to him, they found him with another woman. Her name was Diana Hahn. Both were brought in for questioning. Detective Skip Young interviewed Michael Daly. In our first several conversations with Michael, he did not appear to be the worried, frantic, uh, concerned husband that you or I may be. 
Uh, he was very matter-of-fact, uh, didn't have a reasonable explanation as to why his wife would leave him. Daly told police that at the time of his wife's disappearance, he'd been at the grocery store where he worked. The alibi checked out. Daly's girlfriend, Diana Hahn, denied any knowledge of Sherry's whereabouts. But it wasn't her statement that raised suspicions. Hidden beneath her bangs, Hahn sported some fresh scratches. She claimed she'd had a bike accident and tumbled over the handlebars. Investigators weren't buying the story. Uh, we know from years of police experience that it is impossible for someone to fall over the handlebars of a bike without putting their hands out to break their fall. It's an automatic reflex. Uh, yet she had no injuries on her hands. She had no injuries on her knees. We knew at that point that she was lying to us. Place the roller up against the bruise. Photographs of the injury were taken. Thank In the you. pictures, more, investigators could also see faint bruising on her arms and hands. It appeared that someone had gripped her so tightly that they even caused bruises to her fingers. Police suspected that Han was involved in the kidnapping. She didn't own a green car, but she could have rented one. Investigators canvassed rental car agencies in the Ventura County area. They learned that a car was rented the day before Sherry's disappearance and returned the day after with 126 miles put on it. The name of the renter, records showed, was Diana Hahn. Her credit card had been used to pay for the car and her signature was noted on the form. Detective Conroy hoped that an examination of the rented vehicle would help them find out what happened to Sherry Daly. Even though the abduction had happened, you know, at least a week prior to this, uh, the rental agency had not re-rented the car. Uh, we asked them why. Uh, the car had been returned with the rearview mirror knocked off of the front windshield. Investigators confirmed the car rented by Hahn was green, exactly as witnesses had described. It was towed to the Ventura Crime Lab. There, criminalists processed the vehicle, searching for any sign of Sherry Daly. Throughout the car, they noticed staining. It appeared to be blood. To find out, technicians used moistened swabs to collect the samples. In the lab, the samples were placed in a tube with a chemical that reacts to blood. If blood is present, the swab turns bluish-green. Using this method, Ventura Police Detective Harry Scott got many conclusive results. We found that there was blood on the uh, passenger uh, handle, the door handle on the inside. We found blood and were had been washed uh, up on the uh, ceiling or the headliner area of the car and also some blood in the trunk of the car. Lab work confirmed that the blood was human, but there investigators reached a dead end. Though they suspected the blood was Sherry's, they had no record of her blood type. But science has new ways around that obstacle. Technicians took blood samples from Daly's parents. From these, they generated DNA barcodes and compared them against the DNA rendered from the blood in the car. The results were unmistakable. The blood found in the car had come from the biological child of Sherry Daly's parents. But it was not an encouraging finding. The presence of her blood throughout the vehicle confirmed their worst fears. It was unlikely they would find Sherry alive. Diana Hahn was now the prime suspect. But since they didn't have a body, they couldn't prove that a murder had been committed. 
the police weren't the only ones looking for answers. This is where the community stepped up and friends of Sherry Daly uh, each weekend morning would gather at the department store where she was abducted and they would go out in search parties. On June 1st, nearly a month after the abduction, searchers noticed the odor of decomposition in a remote location on the outskirts of Ventura. Scouring the area along the embankment, investigators found a human skull. They believed they had uncovered the final resting place of Sherry Daly. Police in Ventura, California, continued searching for Sherry Daly, a young wife and a mother of two who had unexpectedly disappeared. A month after she was reported missing by her husband, investigators believed they had finally found her. The search party combed the scene. In the area where the skull and skeletal remains were found, pieces of jewelry were also uncovered. The items were carefully collected in the hope that someone could identify them as Sherry Dallas. Investigators also found clothing, identical to the outfit Sherry was wearing when she was last seen. Their condition told a lot. We were able to match the clothing uh, to the bones, and we were actually able to determine that there were numerous stab wounds uh, through the uh, shirt and through the bra that showed up on the uh, ribs of the uh, victim. Dental records confirmed that the remains belonged to Sherry Daly. Analysis showed that whoever killed her did so with a vengeance. In addition to the multiple stab wounds, her neck had been severed with a sharp object. The medical examiner concluded that after a long, vigorous struggle, the victim had been nearly beheaded. The autopsy findings were consistent with the blood staining found in Diana Hahn's rental car. And if Hahn had endured a lengthy struggle with Daly, it would explain the scratches and bruising that covered the suspect's forehead and arms during her first interview. Detectives believed that Diana Hahn had killed Sherry Daly, but they didn't think she had planned the murder on her own. Searching Hahn's calling card records from the day of the murder, Detective Skip Young found evidence that her lover had been in on the plot. The day of the murder, we were able to determine that there was at least three telephone communications from Diana Hahn to Michael Daly the morning of the actual kidnapping and homicide. One of the calls was made to him from a payphone just minutes from the ravine where the body was found. It appeared that Hahn was checking in with Daly. Police focus turned back to the victim's husband. Take a look at this one right here. Investigators learned from witnesses that Michael Daly was a drug user and that he'd been flaunting his affair with Hahn for the past few years. We learned from close friends and neighbors that Sherry had reportedly given Michael an ultimatum, clean up your act, knock off the drug use, drop the other woman, and supposedly uh, Sherry was actually seeking the advice of an attorney. Investigators speculated that with Sherry out of the way, Dolly wouldn't have to comply with his wife's demands. He could pursue his new relationship without having to pay alimony or share his children. To detectives way of thinking, he had a lot to gain from his wife's disappearance. The evidence against Diana Hahn and Michael Daly was damaging, but investigators still hadn't physically connected them to the kidnapping or the murder. If they were going to make a case stick, they'd need some evidence proving that Hahn had disguised herself as a blonde law enforcement officer. Again, the close-knit community came forward to help. A clerk who was following the case in the press 
told police that she remembered selling Diana Hahn a blonde wig sometime before the murder. The clerk also commented that she had noticed a photograph of a man and two children inside Hahn's purse. She assumed the photo was of Hahn's family. Police showed the clerk a photo of Michael Daly and his two kids. It was the same photograph the clerk had seen in Hahn's purse. Investigators learned that Diana Hahn couldn't have children of her own. They began to suspect that Michael Daly had manipulated her with promises of a bright new future. Detectives continued to build their case. They pored over Hahn's financial records, including copies of checks. One of them was written to a large discount store just days before the abduction. The list of items purchased included a piece of poster board, plastic trash bags, a two-piece tan uniform, and a hatchet. Police obtained a warrant to search Hahn's home. They never found the hatchet or the uniform, but they did locate a piece of poster board. The barcode number on the poster board was identical to that recorded on the receipt. They couldn't understand how the board fit on Hahn's shopping list until they took a close look at the shape cut out of it. It was exactly the same shape as a license plate. That explained why witnesses couldn't see a license plate number. Hahn had covered it over with a fake. Okay, so we gotta be pretty serious about how we planned this. But it was unlikely that Hahn thought of that herself. Get a wig and, uh, Investigators believe that Dally masterminded the murder plot well, days in advance. Her, so it looks like she's getting arrested over some drug dealing. Motivated by the lure of a new life with Michael, Hahn was more than willing to dispose of the one thing she believed was standing in their way. Police believe that a disguised Diana Hahn approached a Sherry as she was leaving the store parking lot. Pretending to be a law enforcement officer, she lured Sherry from the car and handcuffed her. The staged arrest worked to plan, but investigators believe that Sherry Daly quickly saw through the ruse. It is our belief that within a short period of time after Sherry was abducted in the green vehicle, that she somehow recognized Diana Hahn, disguise and all, we can tell by the damage to the interior of the vehicle, mainly the rearview mirror had been knocked off, that Sherry obviously put up some type of a struggle. But Sherry couldn't fight off her attacker. After driving her to a remote location, Vaughn viciously stabbed Dally at least 17 times and placed the body into the ravine. Diana Hahn was arrested for the murder of Sherry Daly on August 1st, 1996. From her jail cell, she reluctantly implicated Michael Daly as the mastermind behind the plot. Daly was arrested the following November. Though the murder investigation had come to an end, Ventura would be forever haunted by the young housewife's tragic end. All she wanted to do was to have a family, have a husband, raise her children. Uh, I still think about this case. I still think about uh, what was going through Sherry Daly's mind when she realized that it was Diana Hahn behind the wheel and she was going to have to fight for her life. Diana Hahn was found guilty of first degree murder and kidnapping. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Tried six months later, Michael Daly was also found guilty in the murder of his wife. He was also sentenced to life in prison. Diana Hahn and Michael Daly were willing to destroy a family in order to be together. When money is at stake, some family bonds can become twisted and deadly. Nestled in the Rocky Mountains of Western Montana, 
Mineral County is known for its frontier feel. But simple lifestyles aren't immune from deadly mishaps. On November 28, 1995, Chris Hansen's wife Nanette went to the stable to feed the couple's horses. She never came back to the house. Hansen found his 34-year-old wife lying in the mud. She was cold and pale. Hansen called 911. He thought that maybe Nanette had been trampled by horses. It's my wife. She was either dead or dying. The operator immediately dispatched an ambulance. When paramedics arrived, Nanette was not breathing. She had no pulse. All her husband Chris and stepson Scott could do was watch as they attempted to revive Nanette with CPR. At first, paramedics' efforts seemed promising. The victim took a single gasp of air on her own. But that breath would be her last. She was declared dead. Since they performed coroner's duties in this small town, the sheriff's department was also contacted. Chris Hansen told investigators he stumbled upon Nanette's body in the muddy trail next to the horse pasture. He said that after calling 911, he phoned his son, Scott Abe, but there was nothing they could do. Because of his multiple sclerosis, he had very poor eyesight. If he had seen her sooner, he may have been able to save her life. Returning from the accident scene to the Mineral County Sheriff's Department, Under Sheriff Anita Parkin had no reason to believe that Nanette's death was anything but an unfortunate accident. And she did have some bruises that looked like maybe a horse stepped on her or, or something similar of that nature. And with the conditions in the barnyard, I could see where somebody may have been knocked down or, or slipped or something happened of that nature. News of Nanette's death spread through the small 3,000-person community. With it, suspicion swirled. Within hours, friends and neighbors of the victim were calling the sheriff's department to voice their misgivings about the tragedy. No one in the community believed Nanette Hansen's death was an accident. Police in Mineral County, Montana, continued their investigation into the death of 34-year-old Nanette Hansen, accidentally killed by one of her horses. But the community wasn't buying that scenario. Close friends came forward to urge further investigation into Nanette's death. To them, the accident didn't make sense. Nanette was experienced with the care and control of horses. She owned only gentle, slow-moving animals. The Mineral County Prosecutor's Office was receiving calls from the same skeptical friends. But so far, there wasn't any evidence to merit the town's suspicion. Attorney Sean Donovan consulted with the Sheriff's Department. They decided that the only way to dispel the rumors was to have the body autopsied. And we both agreed that just for the sake of putting to rest these concerns that the neighbors had, we ought to just have that done, expecting nothing to turn up. The victim's remains were transported to the state crime lab in Missoula. There, medical examiner Gary Dale was asked to determine what caused Nanette Hansen's death. So generally, in fatal horse accidents, the fatalities are due to skull fractures, cervical fractures, and unless someone's rolled over by a horse. And there was no external evidence of any readily fatal type injuries. Uh, the injuries pretty much consisted of scrapes and bruises. Nanette's skull hadn't been fractured. Her spinal cord was intact. There had been no severe bleeding. The injuries that were found were relatively minor. 
a network of small scratches on her head and a two-inch bruise to the left temple. They shaved the hair overlying the bruise and noticed an unusual pattern on the scalp. They could not immediately identify the source of the injury. Nothing about these injuries fit the profile of a horse trampling. Internal examination of the body turned up a large amount of mud and barnyard debris in the victim's lungs. She hadn't died from trampling. She died of asphyxiation. And in this case, you could make uh, raise a possibility that she was rendered unconscious by a blow, somehow slammed by a horse against the stall of the barn, and went down face first into this muck in the barnyard, and then that she basically drowned or suffocated in that muck. There, and then this one. But there was a major fault in that scenario. Nanette had suffered only superficial head injuries. There was no evidence of any brain trauma that would cause her to lose consciousness. A grim new theory formed. There was a fair probability that she was held face down into the ground, into the soft, wet soil by her forearms, by her hands, and that pressure was being applied to her back and to the back of her head. She's basically being forced face first into that. What had initially appeared to be an accident was now being called a homicide. As soon as that happened, we switched from this being a coroner's inquest, which is how this had begun, to being a criminal investigation. With a homicide case opened, the victim's husband, Chris Hansen, was brought in for questioning. They hoped that he could help them find out who might want his wife dead. Though Nanette Hansen's death had been ruled an accident, an autopsy led Montana investigators to open a homicide case. Detectives questioned her husband, Chris Hansen. The many bruises and scrapes on Nanette's body suggested there had been a struggle leading to her death. To find out if Chris Hansen had been on the other end of that struggle, they asked him to remove his shirt. He was covered with what looked like fingernail scratches. When asked to explain the marks, he claimed that he'd tripped and fallen inside the house. Hansen stated that with his multiple sclerosis and near blindness, there was no way he could have physically dominated his wife. Thank you. Though he was telling the truth about his MS, he appeared to be overplaying his handicap. Thank you. You put your shirt on. We, we later learned during the investigation that he was able to play dice and, and see the, the different dice, was able to stand beside a pool table and know which number were on, were on the balls and that he had applied for and received a big game hunting license in 1994. Go ahead and write down your statement as to what occurred on that Though he may have been too sure. weak to work, Everything investigators believed he was strong that. enough no to beat up his wife. Nanette's friends and co-workers said that she frequently had black eyes and bruises. Things had been particularly bad, investigators learned, since Chris's son, Scott Abe, came to town. The 31-year-old hadn't seen his father since he was a small boy. About a year before Nanette's death, he came for a visit and decided to stay. He rented a trailer just a few minutes away and started building a cabin on their property. For father and son, it was blissful reunion. Investigators began looking into Abe's background as well. Say bad things about her other than that. A co-worker told investigators that Abe had been very vocal about his hatred of Nanette. He boasted that he could stage an accidental death by nailing a horseshoe to a board and beating her with it. He said he would do anything to keep her from getting her hands on his father's property and inheritance. Abe appeared to have gotten his way. Poring over records, detectives learned that in the weeks before Nanette's death, Abe had prompted his father to financially separate himself from Nanette. Hansen complied. He canceled their joint credit cards 
and open a new bank account in his name only. It wasn't enough information to make an arrest, but it did get the sheriff's department a warrant to search Abe's property. They searched for any objects that matched the mysterious pattern of cuts and bruises on the victim's scalp. In his trailer, they found a pair of boots. The tread pattern looked eerily familiar. In Abe's car, detectives made another discovery. A homemade weapon called a sap. A leather pouch filled with metal objects. The items were sent to the Montana State Crime Lab. Simply believing that the father and son team had killed Nanette was not enough to prove murder. Unless someone could draw an irrefutable link between this evidence and her injuries, the two would never be charged. Investigators' best hope was now in the hands of forensic expert Debbie Hewitt. It's kind of like uh, putting a puzzle together where you pick up this piece of puzzle and pick up this piece of puzzle and see if it, it will fit in the appropriate space. And when you do find that one final puzzle piece, um, you know that you have the complete picture all done. Hewitt began her analysis with the boots. She pressed the treads into an inked pad, then made numerous impressions on clean white paper. These prints were then transferred to clear sheets of acetate. By placing the prints over a life-sized photograph of the wound, she could determine whether the boot made the injury. The sole pattern from Abe's boot matched the injury on Nanette's scalp. Hewitt repeated the same process with the sap, inking and printing the weapon from a variety of angles. When compared against the large bruise on the victim's temple, the last piece of the puzzle had finally fallen into place. The sap was shown to be a perfect fit for the wound on the side of Nanette's head. Father and son had teamed up to do away with the woman who came between them and their greed. You're under arrest for the murder. But their plot didn't hold up to forensic scrutiny. On February 2nd, 1996, Chris Hansen and Scott Abe were arrested. Prosecutors theorized that Abe first stunned Nanette with the sap, then wrestled her into the mud to make it look like an accident. While Hansen restrained her, his son placed his foot on her head, holding her down until she stopped breathing. Had it not been for the insistence of Nanette's close friends, this brutal act would have stayed buried forever. If she had not been rerouted to the pathologist for an autopsy, we never would have seen these particular types of injuries and bruises and the case would have been written off as an accidental. Both Scott Abe and Chris Hansen were convicted of homicide and sentenced to 60 years in prison. When a murder is cleverly disguised, investigators must find new ways to see through the deception. They turn to forensic scientists to reveal the truth and to bring justice to victims who are killed for love or money. A sniper is on the loose on Long Island. His random pattern leaves investigators with only one clue, the ammunition he uses to hunt total strangers. Investigators in Kentucky try to determine the fate of a woman who has disappeared her family suspects the worst, but there are no clues, no motive, and no crime scene. 
In Georgia, a young man is shot to death on a fishing trip. Police find the body of his fiancée seven miles downstream. But spent bullets are the only clues the killer left behind. In a fraction of a second, a single bullet can shatter many lives. But forensic scientists can decipher clues etched in lead when innocent victims are caught in the line of fire. In this episode, some of the names have been changed to protect the identity of the victims and their families. How is everything? Everything's fine, thank you. On July 22, 1994, Sharon Chaffetz joined her husband, Stephen, for a late dinner at a Long Island restaurant. After many years of marriage, they were looking forward to their daughter's wedding just two weeks away. Suddenly, the window near Stephen's head shattered and he slumped to the floor. The restaurant owner quickly called for help. Suffolk County, New York police and paramedics responded to the call within minutes. But it was too late. Stephen Chaffetz was dead from a single gunshot wound to the chest. No one in the restaurant had seen the shooter. Police processed the crime scene for clues. The trajectory of the bullet suggested that someone had fired a high-powered rifle at the restaurant from an area across the street. No one knew whether the shooting was random or if Chaffetz had been targeted for murder. Lieutenant John Girash of the Suffolk County Police Department led the investigation. He started by looking into the victim's background. In most homicide investigations, one of the first things that detectives do is to try to learn as much as they can about the victim. Most often, uh, the motive lies in, within the, the life of the victim and what's going on uh, with him. Investigators spoke with the victim's family and friends. Has he had any contact with any other... Stephen Chaffetz, a practicing attorney and a CPA, was highly regarded in the community. According to those close to him, he had no enemies. Investigators were perplexed. Why would someone want to kill Stephen Chaffetz? At autopsy, the coroner recovered a 35 caliber bullet a type most commonly used in high-powered rifles. It was sent to the ballistics lab for further testing. Four days later, 23-year-old Andy Gomez was working his shift inside the cashier's booth at a nearby gas station. Without warning, a single shot rang out. The booth's window was double insulated and bulletproof. Gomez was lucky to be alive. Within minutes, police secured the area. They found no trace of the shooter. Gomez had little information to offer police. There had been no attempted robbery, and he didn't see anyone prior to the shooting. The bullet, which fragmented upon impact with the bulletproof glass, was all the shooter left behind. Police collected the fragments and sent them to the lab. The MO for both attacks was identical. Police hoped ballistics analysis could tell them more. After noting the similarities between the two shootings, investigators working the Chaffetz murder shifted their focus. The investigation became more complicated because it, it was obvious to us that the motive did, had very little to do, if anything, to do with the two individuals. Rather, these were now appearing to be random acts. 
and it's those kinds of random acts that make these kinds of investigation most difficult. The metal fragments from the gas station were sent to the Suffolk County Crime Lab. Although they were too small to compare to the bullet recovered from the body of Stephen Chaffetz, scientists were able to determine their metallic content. A visual inspection under a microscope revealed the bullets shared a common coloration. The fragments from the gas station and the bullet that killed Chaffetz both had copper jackets. It was the first small step in linking the two shootings. But examiners could not say with certainty that the bullets were fired from the same weapon. On August 3rd, a week after the gas station shooting, 42-year-old single mother, Kelly Spate, was finishing her shift at a local fast food restaurant. A single shot ripped through the window, hitting Kelly. The manager called 911. Suffolk County police were dispatched to the scene. The victim was badly injured, but still alive. The single bullet passed through her arm and then through her chest, barely missing her vital organs. Police secured the area and interviewed the restaurant's manager. Neither he nor any of the restaurant patrons had seen the shooter. The bullet was found lodged in the wall. Despite the frustrating lack of eyewitnesses in all three cases, the police had an intact bullet for comparison. Forensic specialists examined the evidence at the Suffolk County Crime Lab. The 35 caliber slug was the same size as the bullet that killed Stephen Chaffetz. The two bullets were examined side by side under a high-powered comparison microscope. Each gun has a set of markings inside the barrel called lands and grooves. These markings are etched into the bullet as it travels down the barrel, leaving a series of ridges behind. These ridges are similar to fingerprints in that no two weapons leave identical lands and grooves. When the ridges from both bullets were analyzed, they matched. Lab examiners had finally provided investigators with solid proof that the shootings were related. They told us unequivocally that that bullet and the murder bullet from the first incident were fired from one and the same weapon. That told us as much as anything else. Uh, these were all related cases and with that likely at the hands of one individual. Police had no idea how or when the shooter would strike next. And according to Assistant Chief John McAlone of the Suffolk County Police Department, there were no viable suspects. We didn't have anyone to really concentrate on or any even small group to concentrate on. So the major obstacle in this case was identity. Who could it be? Who was it? And how could we stop him? How could we prove a case against him? As news of the random shooting spread, the community panicked. The press dubbed the unknown assailant the Suffolk Sniper. Investigators feared they were dealing with a madman who shot total strangers for the sheer thrill of the hunt. Suffolk County Police continued their search for an elusive sniper. One man was already dead, and two others had narrowly escaped his deadly aim. Investigators were baffled. There was nothing similar about our victims. This presented almost a nightmare investigatively to detectives because it doesn't give you any direction to start with. Investigators began by compiling a list of individuals who owned 35 caliber rifles. They also searched police records for recently arrested individuals charged with gun-related crimes. Publishers of various survivalist magazines were asked to send in lists of subscribers from the Long Island area. 
police canvassed neighborhoods in the vicinity of the shootings. But residents reported they had not noticed any suspicious activity. Patrol officers set up roadblocks and conducted interviews with thousands of motorists. After several months, investigators had entered over 200,000 names into a database specially modified for the investigation. From these names, Sergeant Edward Light called 600 strong leads. We're looking for people that appeared more than once. For example, if they were held a hunting license and they subscribed to a survivalist magazine and perhaps were on parole, that would raise a flag to the investigators. The Suffolk County Police Department mobilized every available resource to find the killer. The massive police presence in the area of the shootings also helped to calm the fearful community. They visibly saw a lot more patrol cars than they used to. They saw the helicopter overhead, more than likely. They, they saw the canine units all deployed within this certain area of a narrow area of maybe nine or 10 miles. Police were desperate to generate leads. After developing a psychological portrait of the sniper, they appealed to the public for assistance. A detailed analysis of the crime scenes revealed a familiar pattern to investigators. They described the shooter as a white male in his mid-twenties to early thirties, probably a gun lover and an avid hunter. The tactic soon paid off. Police received a call from a parole officer. One of his parolees, a man named Peter Sylvester, fit the profile of the shooter. Sylvester had an extensive criminal record, including convictions for the possession of stolen weapons. And he lived close to where the three shootings had occurred. Investigators decided to put him under surveillance. We had come to know that he was on parole, and with his parole were certain conditions that he had to meet. Our surveillance was telling us that he was violating those conditions. Within a matter of days, Sylvester was observed violating the curfew mandated in his parole. He was arrested and brought in for questioning. At the time of his arrest, Sylvester was in possession of a 9mm handgun. When asked about the sniper incidents, he denied any involvement. Police ran the serial number of the 9mm. They learned the weapon had been reported stolen from a local sports shop. Sylvester was booked for multiple parole violations, including possession of a stolen weapon. Although there was little evidence that he was the sniper, police considered him a prime suspect. How you doing? To learn more, investigators tracked down Sylvester's former employer. He told them that Sylvester had left a 410 gauge shotgun in the back of his delivery truck. Police collected the shotgun as evidence. They also continued to check all gun-related leads. One such lead led detectives to a mental hospital. There, they spoke to a man who had threatened to commit suicide with a high-powered rifle. The patient told investigators that the rifle was a 356 Remington. Although it was not the type of rifle used in the shootings, the patient offered investigators one intriguing piece of information. He told them he had purchased the rifle from a friend, a man named Peter Sylvester. Police ran the serial number on the patient's gun. It had been stolen from a local gun shop two weeks before the shootings began. During this robbery, two other guns were also taken. 
a 35 caliber Whelan rifle, and a 410 gauge shotgun. The serial number of the stolen shotgun was compared to the one recovered from Sylvester's employer. They matched. The third stolen weapon, the 35 caliber rifle, was consistent with the rifle used to kill Stephen Chaffetz. But that gun was still missing. And that third weapon, that unaccounted for weapon, uh, fit almost exactly the, the description of the weapon that we were seeking as the murder weapon. Two of the three stolen guns had been linked to Sylvester. It seemed likely that he was also connected to the missing 35 caliber rifle. Now, investigators needed to prove that the missing rifle was the murder weapon. They visited the manager of the gun shop where the robbery occurred. Exactly on this. Well, we're gonna get Sales through. records indicated the 35 caliber rifle in question had been sold to the shop by a previous owner. Police asked for the address. At this point, investigators had but one hope, that the prior owner still had spent bullets from the rifle in his possession. If so, those bullets Listen, could be compared to the ones and recovered from the crime scene. Go ahead and give us a call. The former owner told investigators that he remembered firing practice shots into a tree during hunting season. But that was a year ago. If he could find that tree, investigators might have the evidence they needed. Suffolk County homicide detective Kevin Cronin was optimistic. He said he had hunted that mountain for about 20 years. He felt very confident that he could find the tree. His confidence rubbed off on us, and we went up there, uh, myself and, and our investigative team. Officers followed the man into the woods. He led them straight to the tree he had once used for target practice. Noting several bullet holes, officers cut the tree down. They sent a cross-section of the trunk to the Suffolk County Crime Lab. In the lab, the sections were cut open. Several bullets were recovered. Examiners could now compare these to the bullets recovered from the body of Stephen Chaffetz. The characteristics of both sets of bullets matched. Investigators had successfully used a missing rifle to link their suspect to the murder. They were slowly building their case against Peter Sylvester. A warrant was obtained to search the house Sylvester lived in with his mother. Officers believed the weapon was somewhere in the house. They checked everywhere. Hidden in the ceiling, police finally found the 35 caliber Whelan rifle. It was now up to the yes. Suffolk County Crime Lab to prove Sylvester was the Suffolk sniper. In the lab, the rifle was fired into a water tank. The bullet was then recovered for comparison with bullets fired by the Suffolk sniper. Under the microscope, ridges on the test bullet matched the ridges on the bullet that killed Stephen Chaffetz. Without a doubt, the 35 caliber Whelan rifle was the weapon used in the shootings. Faced with the overwhelming evidence against him, Sylvester confessed to the shootings. He acknowledged he had never met any of his victims. From a secluded position, he waited for an easy target. He lined them up in his sights and fired. Peter Sylvester was found guilty of murder 
and received a sentence of 35 years to life. No motive was ever established. If we weren't able to solve this case for, for an indefinite period of time, the residents would have to go about with, with a bunker mentality. They'd have to pull down their shade tonight. They'd have to look over their shoulders as they went about their daily routine. We were able to eliminate that circumstance and Suffolk County, as it was before this incident, uh, remains a, an extremely safe pe place to live. Peter Sylvester did not know his victims. But in Kentucky, murder became a more personal matter. The serene landscape of Dry Ridge, Kentucky, hardly seems the place for a terrible crime. Then again, maybe it's the perfect place. On September 16, 1988, the parents of 28-year-old Paula Doherty reported her missing to the state police. In this rural area, the state police handle most investigations. Paula's parents hadn't heard from her for two days. It wasn't like her not to contact them or her children. Paula Doherty, a divorced mother of two, lived at her parents' house. She had been dating a man named Nathan Marksbury for six months and had been spending a lot of time with him. When Nathan heard that Paula was missing, he called the state police to offer his help, though he said he didn't know where she might be. Still, police wanted to meet with him for an interview. They drove to his trailer, located on his parents' farm. He told them that the last time he'd seen her was in the early hours of September 15th, three days earlier. They were at a club with some friends. It was closing time, and their friends had left. Marksbury told police that Paula had called someone to come pick her up. He didn't know why, and she wouldn't say. They waited outside. Eventually, a woman in a yellow or tan car pulled up. Paula introduced her as Shelley or Sheila. He'd never seen her before. Then they drove off, and Nathan went home by himself. Marksbury said the woman was either a cousin or a friend from Cincinnati. Paula didn't seem upset. It was all very mysterious. Investigators thought so, too. Sergeant Ron Harrison learned that it was out of character for Paula to simply up and leave without telling anyone. Prior to her disappearance, uh, the last family member that she talked to was her mother, who she called from the bar. Uh, at her about 10 or 10.30 that night. And uh, didn't indicate to her mother at that time that she was uh, getting ready to call anybody to come and get her. She didn't indicate that she wanted her mother to try to make arrangements to have somebody come and get her or anything of that nature. Investigators spoke to the other friends who were with Paula that night. Each admitted leaving before Paula and Nathan did. And all of them said the evening didn't end on a pleasant note. When they left the bar at closing time, everything was fine. But then, in the parking lot, Marksbury grew upset over losing his keys. One of the friends tried to calm him down, and Marksbury hit him. Sergeant Harrison retraced the couple's footsteps, but found nothing in the bar parking lot. As a result of that altercation, all of these individuals at or about the same time left the parking lot. The only vehicle left on this parking lot after that time was Nathan Marksbury's vehicle and the only people who were here on this parking lot at that time was Nathan and Paula. And this is the last time that we've been able to establish anyone seeing Paula. Sergeant Harrison could find out nothing else about what happened that night. But witnesses claimed that in the past, they had observed Marksbury being physically abusive with girlfriends. If he had been violent with Paula, she hadn't said a word. State police had only two facts to work with. 
a dependable woman who disappeared unexpectedly, and her boyfriend, who witnesses said was abusive. Though Nathan Marksbury was now the prime suspect in Paula's disappearance, there wasn't a shred of evidence linking him to any wrongdoing. Investigators' hands were tied. Though it seemed unlikely, it was even possible that Paula had vanished of her own free will. Paula's family wasn't keeping idle. Desperate for answers, they searched for clues on the Marksbury's farm. It caused some problems. The Marksbury family were talking to me, answering questions, assisting me in any way that they could in attempting to find Paula. And I didn't want that compromised, and they were not happy with the Doherty family being on their property at the same time. As a result, we had to talk to the Doherty family and explain to them that although they had the right to conduct a search, they did not have a right to come on to the Marksbury property. The investigation into Paula's whereabouts continued with interviews of Paula's friends and the Marksbury's neighbors. One neighbor said she might have seen Paula with Nathan after the couple left the bar. Nathan had knocked at their door that night. He said he wanted to party with them. It was late and it was peculiar. They'd never socialized with Nathan before, nor did they want to now. They refused to party with him. They did not see Paula Doherty with him, but they saw the silhouette of a, what they took to be a female in the car, but they could not identify the individual because they didn't get out of the car. And then Nathan left their residence and they never saw him or Paula later that night. It was just another vague clue, but it indicated that Nathan had not gone home alone that night as he said he did. Other stories were equally vague and equally compelling. Many neighbors, including a state police officer, had seen Nathan working on the farm after Paula disappeared. He tended a fire at the farm's trash dump for four or five days. Then he was seen churning the smoldering debris. Neighbors commented that for Nathan to do any sort of physical labor at all was unusual. He was rarely seen working on the farm. It's just a big open pit. For investigators, Nathan's actions were suspicious. His behavior was not consistent with uh, the Nathan that we all had come to know. Uh, Nathan would not get out and do something like that just in order to clean up the farm. Couple that with the fact that uh, all of the leads about where Paula might be had wound up with nothing. I was really interested in knowing what Nathan was doing, what he was burying in that dump. Despite their suspicions, authorities had no basis for a search warrant. They had no legal right to enter the property. Marksbury was free to continue destroying potential evidence. Twenty-eight-year-old Paula Doherty was missing, presumed dead. Paula's boyfriend, Nathan Marksbury, had been seen burning trash on his parents' farm in the days following her disappearance. Kentucky investigators believed Marksbury was destroying evidence, but their best lead was really no more than a hunch. To test their theory, they needed to check Marksbury's trash pile, but they had no warrant. So they tried the direct approach. They asked his father for permission. To their great relief, he gave his consent to search the grounds, just so long as they didn't disturb anything or enter buildings. Anticipating what they might find, the state police brought with them a forensic anthropologist trained to recognize human remains, even when they're tiny shards. At the dump site, that's just what he found. Fragments of human bones. 
At that time, I stopped the search, secured the uh, dump site, and obtained a search warrant. The warrant allowed the state police forensics team just a few days to search the dump site. Because of the size of the site and the burnt and broken condition of the remains, they needed every minute. Parts were sifted and sorted. Some were large and easy to spot. Others were barely recognizable. Once police had gathered as much as they could find, the remains were sent to the central facility of the Kentucky State Forensics Lab. The lab has the capacity to flesh out a case based on the smallest of clues. It's here that an apparently insignificant fragment can become a crucial piece of evidence. Crimes happen elsewhere, but they're often solved here. The forensic anthropologist must literally put the pieces back together to try to get a picture of the victim's identity and to determine what happened. According to Kentucky State Forensic Anthropologist Dr. Emily Craig, it requires patience and a little soap and water. When we first get the bones in the lab, the first thing we have to do is, is clean them up. And uh, we have to get all the debris and soft tissue off of them. And we really have to resort to a procedure we call thermal maceration. But what it amounts to is dishwashing liquid in a crock pot. The cleaned bones are then laid out to see if they are from a single individual. It isn't easy. Fire and mishandling take their toll on fragile bones. It takes an expert eye to recognize and understand how they can be distorted. Part of the problem with burned and fragmented skeletal remains is sometimes a six-foot individual can be reduced to nothing more than the bones you find here in this box. They change size, they change shape, they change color, they break from the fire, but you, uh, you can still go through the ashes and find enough bones, in most cases, to make an identification of the victim and identify the trauma. Ultimately, the forensics lab had enough to work with. From the pelvis and the size of the bones, it was determined that these were the remains of one female individual. Now they had to prove it was Paula Doherty. To make the identification, the lab relied on the victim's teeth, most of which were recovered from Marksbury's farm. Teeth usually survive even the most intense fires, and they're small enough to avoid being crushed by a killer's mishandling. The records matched the dental remains. Paula Doherty had been found. But finding the body didn't necessarily prove homicide. In fact, once the remains were identified, Nathan Marksbury contacted police to say that Paula shot herself, and he disposed of the body because he felt no one would believe that. Law enforcement didn't believe it, but Sergeant Harrison was afraid a jury might. You work an investigation not to meet the burden of charging someone. You work an investigation to meet the burden of a conviction that will stand up on appeal. And it was a concern throughout because there was, again, there was no crime scene per se. There was no uh, physical evidence per se other than Paula's remains. Marksbury said Paula had shot herself in the head. He gave police the gun she'd allegedly used. There were no fingerprints found. It was impossible for the Kentucky State Police to determine whether she had been the one to fire it. If investigators were going to find grounds for a murder conviction, they would have to rely on the remains alone. The forensics lab began the meticulous process of piecing together the fragments of skull collected from the dump site. It was grossly incomplete, but the important parts were there, revealing not one, but two gunshot wounds. They told a lot. 
Though both shots penetrated the skull, neither was necessarily fatal. The victim might have fired both bullets and bled to death. To test the suicide theory, investigators needed to determine the trajectory of the bullets. Dr. Craig inserted rods into the bullet holes in the victim's skull to ascertain the position of the weapon. She found that Paula could not possibly have positioned the gun to her own head at those angles. Someone else had fired the gun. Nathan Marksbury, you're being Police believe that road. person was Nathan Marksbury. He had the gun. He attempted to destroy the body. Based on the evidence, he was arrested for the murder of Paula Doherty. Nathan Marksbury was sentenced to life in prison, plus an additional 15 years for tampering with evidence. Investigators theorized that on September 15th, Nathan's anger raged out of control. He murdered Paula, then tried to cover up his crime. Marksbury's violent temper found a target in the person closest to him. Harder to catch is a killer whose rage is unleashed on total strangers. Waycross, Georgia, May 30th, 1993. Ray Hampton and Jean Dixon were worried. Both of their teenagers, 18-year-old Charlie Dixon and 19-year-old Jason Hampton, were missing. The high school sweethearts had gone on a fishing trip the day before and had not returned. It was not like Jason to forget to call. The two men drove to their kid's favorite fishing location on the Satilla River. Ray Hampton spotted Jason's truck. Their worst fears quickly became a reality. Ray found the body of his son face down in the dirt. The boy had been shot several times. Jean Dixon's daughter, Charlie, was nowhere to be found. After finding his son murdered on the bank of a Georgia river, Ray Hampton radioed the Ware County Sheriff's Department. His son's young fiance was still missing. Police cordoned off the entire area and carefully processed the crime scene. They searched for anything that might point to the killer. Jason Hampton had been shot in the back. Several 22 caliber bullet casings were recovered from the ground near his body. Jason's truck was thoroughly dusted for prints, but none were found. His fishing poles were missing. Police also searched the riverbank for evidence. Still, there was no sign of Charlie Dixon. Local police called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for assistance. Special Agent Bill Butler took the call. We knew at that time that we had a, a major case on our hands. We had uh, a young man who had been brutally murdered, and we had a, another teenage girl who was missing. Uh, certainly, there were, was a great deal of concern on all of our parts to find her and to find the perpetrator. Investigators split up into teams to search for Charlie Dixon in the wooded areas along the Satilla River. She was nowhere to be found but investigators refused to give up hope that they would find the young woman. Seven miles upstream from where Jason's body was found, officers made a tragic discovery. They found the nude body of Charlie Dixon. Like her boyfriend, she had been shot several times. It appears to us in the investigation that the sequence of events that occurred was that uh, after Jason was shot and killed at the scene, that uh, Charlie Dixon was also shot and she was taken from the scene and was taken to the wooded area in the north part of the county near the Pebble Hill community. In less than two hours, 
police were processing their second murder scene. The killer had left behind few clues. No shoe prints or tire tracks were found. Looking for valuable evidence, police collected everything they could find at the scene. Charlie Dixon's body was taken to the coroner for further examination. The coroner determined that Charlie Dixon had been sexually assaulted. Investigators hoped they would be able to extract and identify the killer's DNA from the biological evidence collected. The swabs were sent to the Georgia State Crime Lab for analysis. Forensic biologist John Wagle examined the evidence. When you run the DNA test on the swabs, first thing you determine is, is there enough material DNA present to continue with the test? And yes, there was. The DNA was viable, but police had no suspects to compare it with. They knew they would have to work quickly. The critical time in any major investigation is the first seven, eight hours of the investigation. Well, that's when you're going to do the most important work that you do in an investigation. That includes the crime scene investigation. It includes your initial interviews with uh, uh, victims, friends, and families, and where you're going to find out the most important information in the case that will hopefully lead you to a solution. Hoping to find a lead, police interviewed the victim's parents. This river that was found by was the Hamptons and the Dixons told investigators that their kids were well-liked by their peers and had never been in any trouble. Charlie, a high school senior, was looking forward to graduation. She and Jason, a freshman in college, had just gotten engaged. The parents told investigators that on the morning of May 30th, Jason picked up Charlie to go fishing. They planned to spend the entire day at the Satilla River. That was the last time they were seen alive. The bullets from the double homicide were sent to the GBI ballistics lab for analysis. The lands and grooves on each of the bullets matched. This verified what officers already suspected. Charlie Dixon and Jason Hampton had been shot with the same gun, a 22 caliber Remington rifle. Police had their first solid lead. As we began to proceed in this investigation, uh, we felt sure that uh, a, a speedy solution would come about because we had ballistics evidence, that we had DNA evidence. But they still needed a suspect and a weapon to make a comparison. With no obvious motive, the murders seemed to be the random acts of a stranger. Investigators feared that each day this killer roamed free, more people would die. I know that uh, all of us felt the need uh, to get it solved as quickly as possible before another crime occurred. And when we looked at the brutality of these crimes, we knew that there was a potential there for other people to be victimized. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation teamed up with area law enforcement agencies. Every department was asked to submit reports of recently investigated violent crimes. As we conducted our investigation, we began to look at people who had records for similar crimes. And what we looked at was for any suspect who had a record for either sexual assault, kidnapping, or burglary. Hundreds of potential suspects were interviewed. 60 voluntarily gave DNA samples. The samples were sent to the GBI lab for comparison. None of the DNA samples matched the biological evidence collected from Charlie Dixon's body. Yes. The investigation stalled. So it's been in your possession all week? Yes. And as time went on, we certainly began to get frustrated because we really developed no suspects that warranted any further investigation into. 
and uh, certainly we were, we were beginning to doubt whether we would solve this case. By December of 1993, nearly seven months had passed since the murders. Agents from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations were no closer to catching the killer. Investigators in Waycross, Georgia, struggled to solve the brutal double murder of two high school sweethearts. The list of potential suspects climbed to over 1,000. Identifying the killer would take time. And patience was the name of the game. And we preached it every day in our task force meetings to be patient, to keep proceeding, to follow every lead, to document everything, and to keep going ahead until we found the perpetrator of these brutal murders. Their patience paid off. Investigators finally got a break. It came from a local jail. Authorities told agents about a prisoner who was recently placed in custody for violating his parole. The man had threatened to kill his mother and brother with a rifle. His name was Billy Daniel Rawlerson. A background check revealed that Rawlerson was on parole after serving time on a burglary conviction. Where have you been last week? Investigators questioned Rawlerson about the murders. No? You ever been down there? He denied any knowledge of them. Would you be willing to take Before a blood leaving, blood? investigators asked for a blood sample. All right. Go. Rawlerson consented. At the GBI crime lab, scientists extracted DNA from Rawlerson's blood sample. The results of the DNA test reveal banding patterns unique to each donor. The banding patterns from Rawlerson's DNA were then compared to those taken from Charlie Dixon's body. Computer analysis statistically confirmed they matched. No more than one in 10 million individuals could have that pattern, and that with a reasonable scientific certainty, the DNA from the biological material on the swab originated from Mr. Rollison. All right, let's search this place. Police obtained a search warrant for Rollison's home. There, they found two fishing poles. One was identified as belonging to Jason Hampton. They also found a dismantled rifle, a 22 caliber Remington Model 66. Police hoped it was consistent with the weapon used in the murders. The confiscated rifle was reassembled and sent to the ballistics lab for testing. The rifle was fired into a vertical water tank. The water stops the velocity of the bullet without damaging the projectile, leaving the lands and grooves intact for comparison. Examination confirmed without a doubt that the bullets that killed each of the victims had been fired with this rifle. Faced with this evidence, Rawlerson confessed. Conclusive proof that you raped and murdered. He told investigators that he stalked Jason and Charlie during their fishing trip. When the couple got into the truck, he shot Jason Hampton. He later raped and murdered Charlie Dixon. On March 5, 1994, Billy Daniel Rawlerson was sentenced to die in Georgia's electric chair. When a gun is used to commit murder, bullets can provide the strongest evidence of a killer's guilt. Using advances in forensic science, investigators can read clues etched in lead 
to find justice for innocent victims who have fallen in the line of fire.